Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're really glad to have these three experts with us to uh, lend their expertise. We have Jane Santorum. She's a team leader for the Mountain Lion Foundation's outreach program. And she's helped many families either prevent depredation in her community or to change their animal husbandry practices after they've unfortunately experienced a depredation. She's a founder and team leader for the Julian Mountain Lion Project in her hometown. Julian is a small town in the mountains in San Diego County. We also have Robin Parks. He retired in 2004 after 25 years with the NCIS, that's the Naval Criminal Investigative Services. And he's been a field volunteer and representative with the Mountain Lion Foundation since about 2006, working mostly in San Diego, but up and down the West Coast for us and working with law enforcement agencies regarding encounters with Mountain Lion Foundations. And today we're also talking with uh, Gowan Batiste. She's a farm manager at Fortunate Farm. That's an intergenerational family farm in Mendocino County in California. And she produces heirloom, heirloom vegetables and flowers there. She also grazes her sheep, employing them to manage brush and provide important vegetation buffers to present catastrophic wildfire, help sculpt the landscape for fire resiliency and reserve native plants. So Gowan, we're going to pose the first question to you and start with uh, talking with you about your farming philosophy, which is very holistic. I know you employ regenerative farming practices and while you're working to produce, food and manage the landscape, you're also working to restore the natural environment. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how native carnivores like mountain lions um, fit into that big picture. Um, absolutely. Um, so the way that, that I, I kind of look at our, our presence here is um, we're existing here on this land in the pretty immediate environmental aftermath of broad scale resource extraction, um, uh, genocide of indigenous people and near total extinction of um, apex predators and, and most megafauna in this area. Um, my grandfather uh, told me about growing up here um, as a kid during the depression and literally being sent out by my great grandmother with a shotgun to shoot songbirds and blue jays um, mm -hmm. to boil for broth. Um, and that everything was stripped here, that we can't imagine how devastated it was um, during that time of, of real economic um, distress here in this like small rural community. So that was recent, that was within living memory. Um, these apex predators are the slowest to recover from events like that. And they've still been under threat since then. Um, that, that hasn't gone away for them. Um, so the way that I look at management here um, is really top down. That the, the first piece that needs to be healthy for everything else to be healthy is those apex carnivores. So I actively want to encourage their presence here. And as a as a sheep farmer, you know, sheep are one of the more vulnerable domestic species that we raise. You know, um, they're 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 kind of like nature's tater tots. You know, I mean, they're, they're just these defenseless little nuggets, you know. Um, and so there's a huge history in this county of justification of just broad scale killing of predators. Um, but what I've found is, is really different, which is we have the, the fewest conflicts when we have stable individuals who have the land that we're grazing on claimed as our territory. Um, you know, so I, I graze here on the coast and, and also on thousands of acres inland that is sanctuary land um, in the presence of, of large predators um, all the time, including you know, mountain lions, um, black bears, um, coyotes, bobcats, eagles, um, you know, really all the big California predators. Um, I would love to have wolves back. Um, and really, I, I feel like I can see directly what happens to the rest of, of the ecosystem when, when they're here and they are healthy. Um, you know, one of the main things is, is deer. Um, the primary food of mountain lions is, is the white-tailed deer. It's almost all they eat. 
And um, when we have a lion that is claiming this as their territory, the things that happen with the deer population are really interesting to watch. So basically I start by trying to encourage them, you know, um, I want them to choose this land as a place for them to be. I want them to have the things that they need. And that the end result of that is that everything else will be stable and my sheep will be safe. So um, some of the simple ways we do that is encouraging deer habitat, uh, not running equipment or being present in the field during their peak hunting hours, giving them their space. And then there's specific things that we do to um, keep our sheep safe and to make sure that they don't learn that livestock are an available food source for them. Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, and show some examples of some of the methods that you're employing right now to uh, keep your sheep safe. I'm going to share my screen here and we'll start with a video of your mobile pen and you can uh, tell us what you're doing here because this is um, I think both old technology and new technology, right? Because you're using solar powered electric fences, but you're also using dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, my great great grandparents would absolutely have loved to have this technology. This was actually um, my grandfather's uh, favorite thing that had, had come out of these recent innovations. So what you're looking at is this very, very lightweight fence. It can be rolled up and carried in one hand and it can contain thousands and thousands of pounds of animals with a solar panel. So that's pretty amazing. Um, we can bring all of our infrastructure into the field. Um, and so what we're looking at in this video is, um, this is a night pen and there are versions of these from all over the world. You know, one of the more famous ones is um, a BOMA, um, which is what um, that night corral is, is called in parts of Africa. That's Chago. He's a very good dog. And um, what I kind of do when I'm grazing out, this, this uh, video is, is taken on a neighbor's land that we were grazing um, for fuel reduction and, and to prep for, for removal of these bigger woody invasive species, um, is, you know, I don't have a barn. I don't have a, a night shelter that I can bring out with them. So I make a small pen that's reinforced with extra posts. Um, and I make sure the dogs can completely get around it. So I kind of think of it like a moat. Um, and what that does is during the day they spread out, but during peak hunting hours for predators, they're in a tight space where the dogs can completely see them. Um, the only vulnerabilities of, of the bigger fields is if there's a lot of brush and the dogs can't fully cover it at all times, you know, you might have something happen in a corner. So this prevents that from happening. It also has some interesting side effects in that you cluster all the animals in one place. So you have intensive impact. So I'll often put night pens around patches of particularly noxious weeds that I want to get rid of and then feed them native grass hay so that as they're eating it, they're, they're dropping and trampling in native grass seeds. It's interesting coming back to fields and where the night pens have been always green up the fastest. Um, so this is, at this point in the video, I'm letting them out into the main field. Um, and usually when I set, set it up like this, I'll put their water and their minerals in the night pen and I'll just leave it open during the day so they can get in and out as they want and then I close it off at night. Um, the other two dogs um, that are shown in this video are dogs that are being trained um, that come from, one comes from Hearts for Paws Rescue and the other belong to my cousin. Um, and the other great thing about night pens is you can make, there's Chago again being good, um, you can make little attached and adjacent pens so the dogs can see the sheep, be with the sheep, um, can be let in with the sheep with supervision, and um, you know, you can kind of control those, those interactions. Um, in any way, I mean, this is very accessible technology. I mean, this can go anywhere. I've, I've used this um, everywhere from very dense um, human interference, you know, human presence um, along state campgrounds and state forests, um, all the way out to thousands of acres of very rugged land. And it works in both cases. Yeah, it's really, um, I mean, it's so clever. And I really appreciate being able to see this because I heard you describe it a number of times. And of course, at the Mountain Lion Foundation, we're always advising people to um, 
you know, keep their animals in enclosures and to, you know, especially from dusk to dawn. And you are addressing, you know, this really particular challenge where it's not like they're right on your property or in your barn and you can close them up in a barn or a pen that's just always there, right? I imagine when, you're, when they're home, right. you have that, um, but you have just some um, pretty brilliant ways of managing this in a remote area. And, um, and there's something else that you do too, and I'm getting ready to share that video um, so that other times um, you bring a trailer, because like you said, you're working in pretty remote areas and so you will go ahead and use a, a stock trailer also. And we have some video of that. And you can talk about how you're employing that as well. Because here's another thing that can go almost anywhere, right? As long as you can drive there. Right. Um, and so this, this stock trailer, which is actually a retired stock trailer, um, it's, it's one that I don't take on the road anymore, but I've still gotten years of use out of. So I actually am using this on the home farm. And um, this was a small group of sheep that I had just acquired that I hadn't introduced to the dogs or the rest of the sheep yet. Look, there's, she just had her triplets it's right after cute. getting to the farm. Oh, babies. Yeah, they're very cute. So I put up a divider in, in the trailer. Um, I find that um, we just had a piece of plywood and a couple of brackets um, so that they had privacy for their first 48 hours. Um, and I found that we really don't have losses to ravens if we keep newborn lambs in for their first full day. So that's easy and it, it facilitates bonding. It makes them easy to check on. Um, that's something we can do. So you can see on either side of the fence there the difference between the pre and, and post grazing the day before and then the day after. So, um, and here they come. This is just um, a small group of six out of the trailer where they spent the night and into the field. Um, for their day of grazing. And it's, it's real simple. I mean, we use a tractor to move that around. We've got it in and out of all kinds of places. Um, and it's very effective. And I think one of the things that I have um, kind of learned is that, you know, earlier and from the way I grew up, it's like, you know, you get up and get after it and you're a tough farm kid and you get out there and do chores at five o'clock in the morning. And um, one of the things that I enjoy and I think that the the sheep and the mountain lions enjoy too is like I have a second cup of tea in the morning and I let them out around seven or eight you know and after those peak hunting hours are over and we really you know we've I've I've never had any kind of a conflict using this system in six years um, and this is in areas where we have coyotes howling every single night um, bears and mountain lions coming through all the time yeah, you definitely have predators in your area. And I know you've said that before you started employing these non-lethal techniques about six years ago, you did have uh, as many depredations as anyone um, else would have, um, mostly from coyotes. And since then, you haven't had those depredations, but you did have one conflict with um, a, a very um, distressed juvenile mountain lion. And I, I'd love to hear you talk about that because it illustrates um, the impact of, you know, someone nearby using lethal controls, um, killing mountain lions, um, and creating a problem that then, you know, everybody in the area has to deal with. And yours really is a, a very, just a tragic example of that. Right. Um, I think that honestly, like really like no other single experience has been more galvanizing for me than, than that one. I mean, I was already on board this train. I'd already been using non-lethal um, methods for years, um, but that was a really profound experience. And we'd, we'd had a, um, a depredation. Um, we'd had a, a neighbor who had shot um, an adult mountain lion. And um, in the immediate aftermath of that, um, neighbors started having losses and strange losses, losses that didn't really make sense that weren't within a normal hunting pattern where multiple domestic animals were being killed. Um, and my neighbors called me to come and bring my medical kit because they had had an attack at their place. And, um, and we've talked about this a lot and they really, you know, they knew they had their 
their Angora goats were in their backyard and they weren't in a shelter. They didn't have electric fence. Um, so I came out with, with my medical kit um, and there was an injured um, baby goat and the lion was actually still there, um, kind of unbeknownst to us in, initially. And we were in a situation where um, we were too close um, together for the lion to feel comfortable turning and, and running. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had this moment of, of standoff that, that went on for several minutes um, that ended with blowing an air horn. It's a reason why I always, always, always carry a marine air horn. It's a tiny little horn. It's 15 bucks. They really work. Um, mm-hmm. But this lion was skinny. Um, it was a teenager. It didn't look good. And, you know, we had this this standoff where we're really face to face and maybe only 15 feet away. Um, and we had our backs against the wall and it had its back against the wall. It was, you know, it was down in, in a Creek ravine and we had our backs against the barn and neither of us really knew what to do. And having that moment of really being confronted with the direct cause and effect of what happens. Um, you know, I had read those studies, you know, um, but actually seeing it face to face and, and really, you know, I've seen mountain lions before out in the field and on game cameras lots of times, but usually from a distance, um, being that close to one um, and really feeling the intensity of that, um, of that relationship um, and that confrontation and that cause and effect of, of what we do in our management um, was life-changing for me. And we did successfully, we, we didn't have any um, further issues. And there are some things we added after that. Um, if there's a specific issue like that happening, I'll, I'll, I've used battery powered radios, um, a best of the eighties CD <laughs> on loop, works great. Um, flashing solar motion lights, um, you know, things like that, that I don't normally need, but I'll, I'll put into play if, you know, in a case like this. Um, but, you know, for me, it was just a really strong illustration that this is something that needs community scale response. You know, these cats, their territories are very large. Um, you can be doing everything right, but if you have a neighbor that, you know, is uninformed or that gets scared and that, that takes matters into their own hands, they can reset the work that you might have spent years doing. And, you know, that teenager's mother was a lion that I knew well and a lion who's had lived in our territory for years and whose kills that I would see, you know, she used our deer fence as a hunting corridor. And I would find these like very characteristically killed deer where the the jaw would be dislocated and would be like around the back of the head. That was like her signature move. And I had this dialogue with this lion for, for years. And um, she hadn't taken any of our, of our sheep. We hadn't had a single loss, despite the fact that I knew she was there. And, you know, that I'm face to face with her orphaned child who did domestic stock, you know, and um, these are the consequences, you know, and that's why it's so, it's so important that, that we do proactive non-lethal management. Um, Our chances of having negative encounters or having a potentially dangerous situation for pets or for, or for people or for livestock go through the roof when we destabilize families, just the same way as in our, our human families. I mean, would you rather have a teenager that has parents at home taking care of it or a teenager that's traumatized and hungry and on the street by itself? Right. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a tragic example that just was, you know, had, had horrific fallout for everyone, right? For this, this female mountain lion who was killed, her juvenile who's orphaned and starving, and then the neighbors who have this injury, and then all of you who have this, this terrifying confrontation. You mentioned also that sometimes when you know that there's a, an emerging situation or you've seen a little bit more activity, in the area that you'll employ other techniques like radio. Uh, we've heard talk radio. I think you're the first one I've heard mention, you know, the best of the 80s. So maybe, you know, Madonna and Ziggy Lopper are especially effective. Um, Absolutely. But, I, <laughs> but I, I, I think this is something that I want to be to make sure that we touch on because uh, the people who do this most successfully, like you do, 
are employing a number of techniques, switching it up as needed, and it's never um, as straightforward as simply, you know, having a pen or having some, some sturdy fencing and then just leaving it like that, right? So, so how often do you, you know, change up or relocate your deterrence and adapt to the situation? Well, so I'm, I'm moving across multiple land bases all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so very often, you know, I'm, I'm generally moving sheep every three to five days. So, um, you know, predators in general, they don't like novelty. They don't like things to be different. Um, and so that in itself helps break any potential um, issue, but I, th I think that the bigger part is, is, is looking at it in, in terms of being in relationship and that it's a relationship that's going to have to um, have dialogue and be constantly evolving. Um, for instance, so actually in the video at the beginning with the, the electric fence night pens, um, just about 100 yards from there on the other side of that um, brush hedge um, is my neighbor's house and they had something getting in their trash bins, so they put up a game camera. And they took a film of a bear that um, our, our local wildlife biologist um, thinks must have been hit by a car. Um, had a badly injured back leg, missing fur, so walking on three legs and getting into their trash. And normally um, an injured bear would be a real red flag for me because, um, you know, livestock is never the first choice of a native predator. But if you have an animal that's injured, you could expect, okay, maybe they're more likely to be desperate and to try something that they wouldn't normally try. Um, so taking that piece of information into, an, into advisement, um, you know, I moved the sheep, but not further than I was planning on. So I just moved them to the next acre over and put the night pen in the middle of the field, made sure that the dogs could get all the way around it. Um, never had a problem you know, despite the fact that we were within direct line of sight to where I know that an injured bear was foraging, um, you know, he, he left us alone and, and we left him alone. And um, according to the, uh, the biologist that I talked to, it looked like he was getting enough calories to survive. And I sincerely hope that, you know, he's now healed. Um, so really, even in situations that people would normally think of as red flag situations, where you have an injured animal or you have a, a, a suddenly orphaned teenager, you know, management strategies can happen that even when you know they're there, you, you're not automatically going to have um, an injury or an injury or an issue. You know, we didn't automatically have to take out a depredation permit for that bear just because an injured bear is more likely to cause a problem. You um, didn't. Right. Yeah. Gosh, what a great testament to, you know, the fact that this, this just works. I mean, especially in a situation like that, that would pretty much just be a setup for conflict and, um, and everybody, everybody ends up coming out of it. Okay. I mean, hopefully the bear is doing well and your animals are doing well and you didn't suffer any losses. And so I want to also touch on the fact that you, you employ dogs and um, they're all rescues. And I know uh, when I've talked with you before, you've mentioned that you know, you've talked to other farmers who maybe have tried to introduce dogs with some trial and error. And I think people could probably, uh, you know, skip over a lot of the error <laughs> in that if they hear from people who really are experienced at doing this right. And so how do you set up your dogs for success? I think that the, the first thing to really think about is that these, these dog breeds are, are old. They've been doing this a long time um, and mostly not in this country. Um, the, the kind of mythology and, and approach to how we, we tend to handle livestock guardian dogs in the States, I think is not really based in the, the cultural wisdom of, of how these dogs work. Um, there's kind of this idea, and, and you'll still hear old timers say this, where you, you can't pet them or you'll, you'll ruin them and, you know, you have to completely, you know, and sometimes you come on farms and you see these dogs that are just essentially feral, you know, they don't get vetted, they don't get touched, they're, you know, and it's, it's really sad, you know, and that's not what my dogs are like, you know, my dogs are all over me and I'm all over them all day and it's, it's great. Um, so, it, 
they work, they work for you. You know, they, they bond with the sheep, they bond with you. Um, and that working bond is not a detriment. And I think that that's probably the thing that I see people fail at the most. You know, an undomesticated dog is, is a, a wolf, <laughs> you know. We're not trying to undo that minimum 10,000 years of socialization. Um, it is okay to be bonded with them. Um, and the other part is to understand that they mature very slowly. They're ancient breeds. Um, they're, they're not really anything like other dogs. They're not going to be fully mature until they're about three. So having the patience to actually fully invest yourself in that relationship is also really important. And also understand they're independent. They're supposed to be independent and their conception of what their territory is and your conception of what their territory is might not be the same thing. So you have to approach um, containing them really carefully because you can have conflicts with, with neighbors, with dogs getting on the highway. Um, so I, I think that the way of approaching it is really to look like, you know, this is a, a partnership the same way as, you know, working with another human being. It's gonna take time. Um, and really, you know, their instincts are, are working with you um, they want to bond to the sheep. The sheep want to bond to them. I mean, you sh should just see Chago, like he gets completely covered in piles of lambs and mm -hmm. it's, it's, un it's unbelievable. They will, they'll break your heart. These dogs will break your heart. And the work they do is rare and work for them is rare. They're very common in shelters. Um, they're very hard to rehome. Um, two of my dogs are fire evacuee rescues. Um, it's, you know, they're hard to place, you know, you, you can't put them in an apartment. Um, and so I would really encourage folks who, especially if you keep small livestock, um, to, to go ahead and, and, and take it on and, and get into these dogs. It's, it's worth it. Um, but it's, it's a process. You need to put, if you're, you need to really be willing to put as much thought and time and energy into the dogs as you put into your, your sheep or your goats or, or whatever it is you're asking them to guard. Um, they're, they're not, they're not an add-on. Yeah. You know, I love the way you do your dogs and it's, you know, it's humane. The dogs have a great lifestyle. They're doing really excellent work and they're, they're socialized. And so they can be around people. We do hear from ranchers who say that they worry that their dogs are a liability, right? Because they're not socialized. They're using that, that old idea. They're working off that old idea that these dogs have to be kind of semi-feral. And then you have semi-feral dogs and that's, uh, that's not always a really good thing. Uh, I want no. to get ready to introduce um, Gowan, uh, not Gowan, but uh, Robin and Jane into the conversation also with Gowan. Um, because Gowan, I mean, you, the work you're doing is work that, I mean, we would love to bottle it up, right? The Mountain Lion Foundation would love to see everybody, uh, in, everybody running their farms and ranches the way you do. It's just, uh, it's so good. And so our people like Jane and Robin are the ones who are out there interacting with the public, talking with urban edge dwellers, talking with um, people who are farmers or ranchers, mostly hobby farmers. Um, so Jane and Robin, why don't you come online now? And we're going to talk a little bit about these visits um, just to let you know that, um, you know, the Mountain Lion Foundation has these volunteers in the field and sometimes we hear from people who say, you know, I had a, I, I, I saw a mountain lion and I'm worried about how to protect my chickens or how to protect my pets um, or people call uh, for help after they, you know, unfortunately have had a depredation or have had a loss or some kind of conflict. And um, so Jane and Robin are experts at going out and talking with these people. Jane, uh, let's start with you and maybe you can tell me what kind of information you gather. Um, I, I, I said I wanted to ask you what things you look for and you said it's not so much things, but there's a lot of information that you gather when you first go to someone's house, either for a preventative visit or following up from some sort of a, a loss or conflict. Absolutely. Um, Let's first look at uh, a home visit that I might do after there has been uh, a mountain lion uh, come and 
unfortunately do some damage to somebody's uh, hobby animals or pets because most of the visits I do uh, here in, in the Julian area are not huge ran ranches. Um, occasionally I will consult with a rancher, but most of these visits are um, on the urban edge kind of, I mean, we're, we're out here in a rural area. So when I, when I first get to someone's home, um, the very first thing that I will look at is confirming that it was really a mountain lion because so much of the time, hi kitty, <laughs> so much of the time, um, so much of the time it, it's not a mountain lion. So um, let's just uh, for sake of this discussion, uh, say that I have, in some way confirmed that it really was a mountain lion. Uh, next, I try to get as much information as possible. Um, I take a lot of notes, I ask a lot of questions. Um, I want the person, um, the owner of, of uh, the animal that has uh, had an altercation, you know, to tell me as much as they know about what happened. I need to know what the lion did and try to figure out how he did it. Okay. Um, the next thing I'm going to want to do is increase the person's immediate safety. So I'm going to be recommending an air horn and lighting around their home or things mm -hmm. they can do right now that will help make them safer and make their pets or livestock safer, whether that's trying to shore something up real quick or, or something, uh, maybe installing a, a fox light, which is a wonderful random flashing light. Um, and then um, also at the same time, I really need to be sensitive to their emotional uh, distress. Some people aren't distressed when there's an issue and some people are very distressed and uh, are pretty shocky um, in a way. So if they're in that state, I can't expect them to make a decision and to problem solve really effectively. So I need to give them some space to do a little healing from what they have, have just experienced with this loss um, and, and then kind of walk them through the next step. Um, so also um, just to mention that in our community, it's a very small community. And if you post something either on social media or with a billboard on the post office or something like that, people are gonna respond and not always in a supportive manner. Some people are gonna say, well, why don't you shoot it? You know, mm -hmm. which we're not encouraging. And some people will say, well, what did you expect? You didn't protect your animal. So a lot of these responses from the community can be very hurtful and stressful to the person um, who's just had this depredation incident. Um, if I could put in a word for the general community, the best thing that you can possibly do is offer help instead of judgment. Um, maybe you have a Saturday afternoon that you could come over and assist them in putting up a pen, or maybe you have some spare materials that you could donate. So supporting the person rather than um, shaming and blaming them is, right. is really important. And then I follow up with a long-term plan. I'm going to share the screen again and show a picture of one of these um, pens um, that, that Jane mentioned. And so Jane and Robin, you both have been involved in uh, a number of these, helping people set up these kinds of pens. If you go to our, our website, and I think we'll have a link for that too, we actually have a new video that shows you how you can just really affordably build this pen. I mean, Gowan showed you her great, uh, you know, mobile pen um, or her stock trailer. If you've got an area on your property where you can do some sort of a semi-permanent structure like this, you can make this from, you know, off the shelf, off the rack, uh, dog kennel components and um, add that safe top. And so, um, Robin, I wanted to ask you too, because I know you've, you've worked in the Julian area and around San Diego County. You've also traveled for the Mountain Lion Foundation and talked with people in other states. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the common questions or challenges that you hear when people are considering, you know, employing some of these safer husbandry practices 
and uh, it, sort of what barriers they have to work around to prepare for that. Okay, well, thank you, and thank you all for uh, being patient with me during my computer malfunction. Um, I have indeed uh, encountered a variety of things uh, that people, um, barriers or beliefs or misconceptions, and I'm not sure if now we're at this minute is the time to talk about that. But there is, uh, there is, uh, there is often the uh, the view, and and Jane talked about being supportive and not judgmental. But there is often the view that. And frankly, uh, there's no way to there's no way to gracefully say it. People sometimes believe that they have the total right to to put out animals unprotected, um, knowing that they live in mountain lion country. Um, to some of us, this may not make sense, and to some of us, this may call for judgment. But the idea of uh, Jane's idea again is of being supportive and sympathetic is whatever whatever is usually the a usually a a better approach but there is that often that concept that I, they're my animals they're out there i don't really have to do anything to protect them i can deal with whatever is um whatever is attacking them whatever is threatening them and that is a major hurdle sometimes to overcome that you know fences and fox lights and air horns and other things are really a great and cheap and effective idea. Sometimes that's just simply a hard sell. Yeah. So when people get around that, I know um, one question that comes up quite a bit is, um, you know, what, what someone would have to invest. And I know, Gowan, you have some thoughts on this too, because we've looked at your, your portable electric fencing and some of the methods that you employ. Um, and in your mind, it really isn't about um, costs, but about savings, right? Um, so this is, this is a topic that I talk about a lot, especially in the farming and ranching community here. And I get told a lot how these methods won't work. Mm -hmm. um, they won't work because it's different here. They won't work because it's too steep. They won't work because it's too much land. Um, you know, completely ignoring the fact that I graze on the same land, which is also steep and rocky and, you know, um, and I, I understand, I, I feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously speaking more from the side of the ranching community than from, you know, the, the home and homesteader community, because that's where I live. But, um, I think that there's this sense that um, there's just absolutely no time, money, or mental or emotional energy to do anything extra. They want to just keep doing what they've done, and um, the trapper is free. It's paid for by the county. Um, however, I think that there's a huge missed opportunity in the ranching community because, because I graze the way that I do, um, I can sell my fiber for more money than if I didn't. You know, there's a, a network through Fibershed, which is um, all over California, um, that, you know, pro provides sales outlets for, for high-end fiber that is, is raised according to a carbon farm plan. You know, they even have a separate category called tender shepherds for shepherds that don't, um, that don't sell meat. Um, so vegans and vegetarians, you know, can feel more comfortable buying their fiber. I mean, there are so many um, opportunities to be able to not just offset these costs, but to actually step into whole markets that um, people are missing out on because they, they just don't feel that they have the like wherewithal to innovate. And what I see is a lot of, of my generation, people who are my age in their 20s and 30s who are running um, contract grazing operations, we mostly don't have institutional and family access to large tracts of land, whereas the large, you know, inherited ranches are mostly being managed in this shoot, shovel, and shut up kind of paradigm. Um, I'm hoping that what can happen in like over the next couple of decades is that we can have a management transfer um, so that you know the age in agriculture in general is really high, cash capital is really low. Um, and there's just a sense that it, it's not worth it to try anything new because um, the margins are already so slim. Um, 
Personally, you know, I have never been a coyote shooter, but before I started really actively using these methods, I lost about the same percentage of lambs every spring that everybody else does. You know, I'm raising heritage breed sheep that I'm, I'm mostly selling as fiber animals. They're generally selling for between $800 and $1,200. You know, these are like high end, you know, rare sheep, you know, a loss is a big loss. If I lose 15% of lambs in the season, that's thousands of dollars. Um, it more than pays for, you know, some rolls of mesh fence that are each about 150 bucks and a solar energizer that's 250 bucks. Like these are not actually super unattainable systems. Um, so Anyway, I have a lot of thoughts about the economics of this, and obviously I, can, I, I don't want to take up too much time on it. Um, one of the primary things that I actually get paid for is grazing for fuel reduction and management, so for that service in itself. And I couldn't do that unless I was using these portable systems because I'm often grazing where there is no hardscape fencing. So it's either an added expense or it's a, it's a whole new income stream and opportunity. It's really more about you know, whether you have the energy and the education to pursue it or not. Right. Yeah. And Jane and Robin, I know you, you know, in working with a lot of people who, you know, are not farming and ranching on the scale that Gowan is, um, how often do people need to make changes that just are, you know, really a pretty minor in terms of material and time and expense? What are some of the examples that you have? Very frequently, um, I will be called to uh, look at a structure um, because you really have to know what a mountain lion is capable of. Um, mm. They're very clever, they're very strong, uh, and you really need to know some of those specifics of what they can do in order to translate that into making a really secure pen. For example, I assisted a gentleman who had a very large chicken coop, and Robin probably remembers this, he was helping, um, but this particular mountain lion um, was coming by to get chicken dinner for her kittens on a regular basis, and she thought up three different ways to successfully do that. Um, and so you really would need to look at what they can do because she was very innovative and we were successful in looking at, at what her behavior had been and shoring up those uh, weak spots in his structure. Um, and then Mama Lion went on and probably taught them how to hunt deer. So, um, it, it happens. <clears throat> People frequently don't know what a mountain lion could do, and they put all this money and time and effort into building uh, a cattery or, um, or a chicken coop, and then we'll say, well, it didn't work, but it, it's just a matter of knowing what your predator is capable of and how to prevent them from using their clever, strong skills. Right. I would imagine that if people only have a little bit of time and money to spend on this, you know, somebody with experience like you and Robin, uh, it could really tell them how to get the most bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me add exactly. to that. Let Go me ahead. add to that. Jane has much more experience with the house calls and uh, pending to a, uh, an incident, um, you know, an after action incident than I have. So I, I will certainly defer to her on some things. But in those occasions where I have, uh, have kind of been the first one or the guy on the scene or the first responder or whatever, um, much of what we have said is true. Some of these fixes, you know, as clever as the mountain lines are, and they are, and as persistent and as capable as they are, some of these fixes are not expensive, relatively speaking. Some of these things like air horns and fox lights and and tightening up four, you know, four inch uh, uh, holes and fences and whatever, so uh, somebody doesn't grab through it. Some of these uh, uh, fixes can be done on the cheap. And it seems to me, uh, I, I realize I'm not the farmer and I'm not the one spending the money, 
but it seems to me that some of these economical fixes are a much better solution than losing your animal, uh, uh, which can cause you grief, which costs you money, uh, which costs you time. Um, so, so I, I think we, you know, I think all this is the right course to propose some of these fixes again, and some of them are not, you know, we're not talking rocket science, and we're also not talking, you know, uh, we're not talking a ton of money. So I, I think we have done, you know, I think we're on the right course with many of these things. Yes, and it's worth pointing out too that all of, all of you are speaking to us from California, which uh, is a state where there really is more protection for uh, the lions in these situations and um, more of an approach to prevention and deterrence. But Robin, you've been working with law enforcement since before that was the case. And I thought I'd uh, have you summarize for people um, the way the way the law has changed over the last few years from this, um, you know, oh, if you have a problem, you take out that animal to now a focus on um, on prevention and non-lethal management that that really encourages requires people to walk through these steps. Well, um, and not to not to make too long a process here, but the. But what got me first into the Mountain Lion Foundation was a couple incidents in Southern California where local law enforcement, and I'm talking about fish and wildlife, that's a whole different, a different story, but where local law enforcement uh, came upon a mountain lion and just killed it for no apparent reason other than it was there and they had a gun and shot it. Well, that stuck in my craw, so to speak. And so I, um, uh, I eventually came in contact with Mountain Lion Foundation and eventually that worked into me trying to work up a program to um, provide training to law enforcement agents, agencies, sheriffs and police departments um, that work in mountain lion country to teach them some basic fundamentals about mountain lions. And that not always is it necessary to kill one just because one shows up in somebody's backyard. Well, I, I wanna be careful here. I, I'm, I'm not at all claiming victory and I'm not at all claiming uh, uh, credit for a lot of this. But there have been changes that I have seen within law enforcement, or particularly over the last five years, where um, there is not that before, many times if law enforcement was called to a scene where a mountain lion was, the cat was dead. The, the cat was dead before they, they got out of the car. It's just the way it was. So now that is not the case. And particularly in the last three to five years, there have been only just a very few incidents where a civilian, a, a, a local agency has responded to a mountain lion incident where the cat was killed right away. And one or two of those have occurred up in Julia. Uh, uh, there have been others that there have been an exception or two, but very rare. And, the, and now the, the attitude seems to be on, on one side we have laws we have sb 132 we have some other protections in place but there seems to be this attitude that you know we just don't have to kill this thing uh we can you know we can surround the place and give it away out if it wants a way out we can call animal control we call fish and wildlife get those guys out here uh you know to do with they're the experts let them do it and there just seems to be a as somewhat of a, a, a reticence to kill the animal. And, and th that is a multiple, you know, that is the result of multiple things. And one of the things is Mountain Lion Foundation doing all the things it's doing relentlessly, uh, you know, courageously, persistently to, to get policy and get laws and whatever. And, and Mountain and MLF can take a lot of credit for that. But there are other things about, edu you know, just education and bringing animal control and different groups different animal activist groups into the mix is very important. So anyway, I, I, have, seen, I, I have seen a slow, but very uh, observable uh, change uh, statewide in California, not so much in other places, but in California, I've seen a, I've seen a change in that. And um, uh, it, is, it is just very remarkable. And one of the, perhaps the main thing that changed it was the Half Moon Bay incident in mm -hmm. 2012. And that ultimately resulted in SB 132. Um, 
so the, there has been there has been a very noticeable change, and it's something I'm very we're very glad to see. Yeah, and it, it, like you point out, it's not only um, a change in law enforcement practices and in the law and California Department of Fish and Wildlife rules, um, but there's a cultural change. And those of us who are in other states, uh, Oregon, uh, for myself, I know we have people from all over the place on the call today. I mean, you know, we don't necessarily have those same legal structures in place, but we can take it on ourselves to make these changes in our own practices um, and help others uh, uh, do the same. And in the few minutes we have left before we open it up to q and A, I I wanna make sure that we also talk about companion animals because I know Jane and Robin, you both have worked with families who uh, you know, even have had a depredation um, on pets and then they need to employ some measures to keep their companion animals safe. Um, first and foremost, uh, I want to get in here. Do not tether your dog. Mm -hmm. um, it's like tying a stake out there. Um, it's just beckoning trouble and your dog can't get away and it's a terrible, terrible setup. So that is not an option. <laughs> Tethering a dog is not an option in mountain lion country. Yes, absolutely. But then I think you've seen people uh, create some catteries and different kinds of enclosures that really were specifically for their companion animals. Yes, I have. I've seen a big increase in uh, people building catteries um, adjacent to their home. Uh, little cat doors being built that go out into a patio that they've renovated. Um, and that seems to be on the uprise, which I think is wonderful because we not only have mountain lions, but we have coyotes and other, other, <clears throat> other things, excuse me, that um, are lethal to kitty cats um, or small dogs, uh, cars and, and rodenticides, all kinds of trouble that they can get into. <clears throat> um, so this gives the cat or, or dogs access to sunlight, fresh air. Um, maybe they have a grassy little spot that they planted within this uh, enclosure. Um, so I'm really happy about that. Uh, the only thing that I caution people with is do find out what a mountain lion is capable of. I visited some folks who built a beautiful cattery um, with a lot of thought given to everything except the wire um, fencing part was not secured at frequent enough intervals to prevent a cat paw from reaching in and um, killing a cat and then bending the wire enough to pull the body out. Um, so they were heartbroken. They had gone to all this effort and, um, and still lost a cat where it was just a simple matter though of learning how closely, um, how frequently that the wire needs to be secured down. Those cat paws are big, but they're agile. Yes, well, these are large animals, right? They can jump 12 feet, and if they get on the top of your structure, you know, they can weigh 100, 150 pounds, and so it needs to be strong enough for that. There are things to consider, but all, um, all very doable. And so I think, you know, just in, uh, as we close up, it, I want us to talk a little bit about really how easy and approachable it is to adopt some of these techniques. And I know Jane and Robin, you've, you've talked about how you've helped um, homeowners adopt some of this. Gowan, I thought I'd maybe circle back to you and talk with you about um, you know, the, the portability and ease. You touched on that a little bit, uh, but you said that you hear from a lot of ranchers in your area that, it, look, they're just, everybody's working as hard as they can. There just isn't you know, time and money left at the end of the day to do these things. Uh, but in your experience, it really isn't, isn't requiring that much. And as you said, even your days, your mornings and your evenings are a little more leisurely since you've employed these techniques. Yeah, um, something else that I think that is, is really nice and really important is that these scale. 
really well. You know, you can put together a system with electric fence that works for three sheep or one that works for, for 300 sheep. Um, then the same is not true of physical infrastructure. Um, you know, if I was hardscape fencing everything and building pole barns, that's much, much more expensive. Um, you know, these are, are not, um, are not nearly as, as expensive as the kind of conventional, you know, trappings of, of, of ranching. Um, I think something else that is, is important to kind of remember and, and to take into consideration is that like for me as a, as a sheep farmer, um, my number one um, worry isn't any native carnivore, it's domestic dogs. Um, mm -hmm. Domestic dogs are what has caused um, the most, you know, massacres of sheep for both for me and for everybody that I know by a ridiculously large margin. And, um, you know, it, people don't tend to like it when you shoot their dogs, you know. Um, so <laughs> Um, electric fence, one of the things that's great about that too is even if you did have a conventional pole barn structure or even if you do have the kind of night pen um, that you can build out of um, the kind of, you know, kennel materials, um, solar paneled electric fence, as long as it's properly grounded and you don't have flammable dry materials touching it, you know, as long as you set it up safely, is really amazing because um, a lot of the things that work on native carnivores don't work on domestic dogs because they're not deterred by weird human stuff that um, native carnivores would would stay away from. So I, I, yeah, I guess I would just say that um, when when people say that it's expensive, it's expensive compared to what? You know, um, I've fluctuated the size of my flock multiple times over the years, grazed on different land bases, um, you know, back and forth across the county and all the way to Yolo County on uh, steep, rocky, hot, wooded, heavily forested, heavy brush. And I've used the same tools each time with minor variations and it works and it's much, much less expensive than building a conventional pole barn or putting up um, ring fencing on, you know, thousands and thousands of acres. So, yeah, I mean, as far as the expense argument goes, um, the, the labor difference um, isn't even that high either. It just takes looking at labor differently. Um, you know, because again, all that infrastructure also takes labor takes a lot of labor to put in T posts and stretch barbed wire, you know, through those steep and rocky areas too. Um, it takes more labor. Um, so I, if anything, I think I probably do less work. I just do work that is lower intensity and more frequent. Right, well, and you know, the horrifying uh, conflicts that you described earlier, I mean, you're avoiding all of those now, which is worth quite a bit, you know, in terms of your peace of mind. Well, it is uh, straight up at the top of the hour now, so we'll go ahead and open this uh, conversation up to question and answer. I can see from the chat comments that uh, people do have some specific questions. We probably have a number of people waiting to ask questions, so please make your questions as brief as possible, you know, 30 seconds or so just to um, state your question. You will use the raised hand feature. Watch for the little icon that's in the shape of a hand. Uh, if you click that, then it will put you in the queue. Chelsea will call out your name when it's time for you to ask your question and she'll unmute you. You might have to also unmute yourself depending on what system you are on. Suzanne, you are our first to ask questions. Go ahead. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have so many questions I could monopolize this whole thing, but I won't. <laughs> so quickly, um, first off, um, what's the, the voltage that's delivered on those electric fences? And do you ever, they seem to be not that tall. Does a mountain lion, is he willing to jump in to get the sheep? And then lastly, um, typically the tra um, thinking is, is that the livestock guardian dogs have to be raised with sheeps from, sheep from puppies, but you talked about getting them as, a, as adult rescues and it seems to work okay. So those are my first three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So um, what I would say about the voltage is that it depends. Um, up to around 7,000, but it depends on the kind of polywire you're using. It depends on the charger you're using. Um, you want to have a voltage meter. Um, you know, it's, it'll definitely wake you up. Um, but it's, it, it's really also not too bad. I get shocked by it all the time. Um, I, I think that the, the next one about the height of the electric fence, um, yeah, so a mountain lion is absolutely capable of jumping over the electric fence. Um, I probably can't put up a fence that a mountain lion can't jump over. However, the fact that the fence is not um, rigid, they can't climb on it, it's, it's a mesh. In general, I found that they're pretty hesitant about it. They, they don't want to touch it. If they do touch it, they get shocked by it. I, um, I'm actually pretty sure that a mountain lion has been shocked by my fence based on um, what I heard, although I didn't see it, so I can't confirm it could have been a bobcat or something, but there was a very upset kitty at one point mm -hmm. um, near me encountering the fence that had sheep in it. Um, so technically, yeah, you know, they can jump over the fence. In general, I find that they don't. The fence that I use for the night pen is slightly taller, um, but, you know, it I, I really haven't encountered that being a problem. There's also the dogs, you know, the mountain lions, if they get hurt, they, they'll die. They have to be in, in perfect condition all the time because they're an obligate carnivore. So they're not gonna risk having a run in, you know, with two or more dogs, it's just not gonna happen. As far as the dogs go, um, there's all kinds of schools of thought. It's also, it's a huge topic and I don't wanna monopolize either. Um, people say that they need to be exposed within a certain window when they're puppies. Um, I have gotten older dogs that have turned out to be good um, livestock guardian dogs. Um, when you do rescues, you know, it is more of a crapshoot um, as, as far as what their background is, um, what they've been exposed to, if they're potentially mixed, you know, with other breeds that are not L LGD breeds. Um, and you really just have to evaluate on a one by one basis, but I wouldn't discount an adult dog um, from from being able to do to do the work. I did it. Okay, um, Desi, did you still have a question? You'd be up next. Uh, my question was answered um, in the chat privately. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So Paula, you are up next. Hi there, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi there. Thanks for all this great information. Um, yeah, I just, in all the talks that I've heard about um, guardian dogs, it seems like they use very specific breeds. Um, I think it's super cool, Gowan, that you're using rescue dogs. That's really cool. Um, and so I was wondering, I don't know if you mentioned specifically what breeds um, that you have rescued that you're using, but I was just curious about that. Um, sure. So I've had Maremmas, Great Pyrenees, and Anatolian Shepherds and mixes thereof. Um, I really don't have experience with some of the more um, Eastern um, breeds like the Avcharkas or the Akbash. Um, but, you know, in general, I, I prefer the, um, the Maremma and the Pyrenees. Like I'm, I am grazing often in, in really close proximity to state parks and campers. And I often have, you know, people with kids walking right past my fences. So I really can't have aggressive dogs. My dogs need to be people social um, as well as um, bonded to livestock. So that's what I mostly look for. All right, uh, looks like Suzanne has some more questions. <laughs> Great. Well, I put my my name in the queue if there was nobody else. But so okay. So um, with the with the uh, solar panel fence or so, solar powered fence, the sheep and dogs who are inside can they um, trigger it and be uh, shocked as well? And then my other question is, you kind of alluded to this. It sounds like that 
that that you're hoping that these techniques would be adopted by people with larger herds who are flocks of sheep who really aren't all into this way of approaching things right now is that kind of what you're saying um so i i think so the first the first question about the electric fence yes um they they can be shocked by it wool is actually a great insulator um so the the sheep um can really they i mean they can rub up against the fence and they they really mostly don't but if they put their nose right on it they will get shocked it's important to train them to it and to train the dogs to it when they're within another hardscape fence because sometimes if they get shocked and they get scared they can startle forwards instead of startling backwards so you have to make sure that you are with them the first time they encounter it um, but they learn very fast and lambs learn from their mothers too. So, I mean, I have plenty of lambs who respect the fence who I'm, I'm almost certain have never been shocked by it just because their mothers respect the fence. Um, as far as scale, there are actually like quite a lot of larger scale sheep farmers that use these same techniques um, um, from hundreds to thousands of sheep. Um, in California. At any given time, I generally have a flock of around 50 because that's the size that I like to have for the kind of fast movement that I do and the kind of grazing on close proximity to camping and parks and stuff that I do. Like a much bigger group than that would be less efficient for me, but um, there's sweet grass grazing, there's chaos sheep outfit, um, there are, there's also um, uh, Ruthie King's grazing operation, and they're all grazing hundreds to thousands of sheep. And in Chaos's case, like several thousands. Okay, that was it for questions. Oh, wait. Yeah. Or sorry, Molly Conway, one more question. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if anybody could add any thoughts on adapting um, these strategies for beef cattle um, rather than sheep. I'm out in Kentucky. We've got about 200 head of cattle here and we've started to see evidence that there's a mountain lion around and we're coming from a place of not wanting any conflicts and uh, you know we're specifically not telling people around us because of that shoot, shovel, and shut up mentality. Um, but any tips on uh, reducing our likelihood of having a loss or an encounter would be helpful if you could speak to that. I, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings, but I don't want to monopolize the Q&A either. Um, if, if Jane or, or Robin has anything to say, and then I'm happy to jump in too. Um, I, I can offer one tidbit. When I was talking to a, a multi-generation ranch um, who has a lot of uh, cattle and fortunately a lot of land, and he said that um, he only remembers losing about one calf per generation. Um, so that would be about four calves total to a mountain lion. Um, and he attributes it to the fact that he has lots of land. Uh, I don't know whether you're in that situation or not, but the more land you have, the more likely it is that the cattle are, are going to stay away from something they, they uh, smell or believe is in the bushes. And also the more likely the deer are going to be there and the lion is going to go after the deer instead of the cattle. Um, so the more land you have, uh, I would say the better. Um, Gowan, go mm -hmm. ahead and offer whatever you have. Um, so I also raise um, cattle. Um, so we've got um, our own small um, small herd um, and then the, the ranch that my, my partner manages um, has a lessee with like about 250 pairs in the season. So I'm, I'm also around cows. In general, mountain lions um, really aren't gonna bother cows. Um, their, their prey is white-tailed deer. That's really what they want to go after. They're not really gonna be excited about going up against a much bigger animal. Um, an adult cow can absolutely trample and badly injure or kill a cougar, um, even if they don't have horns. 
Um, however, you know, an occasional young calf loss is, is possible. The, the losses that that sometimes happen out in the big ranch are almost all during calving and they're newborn calves and they're mostly to coyotes. Um, so some of the things that you can do there are structural is when it's time for calving, plan the grazing rotation to have them as close as possible to the most populated parts of the farm where you're going to have less predators being comfortable being. Um, you could also try fox lights on fence posts during, um, during calving. Um, and you could also do a BOMA, which is, you know, I mean, the people who know the most about coexisting with lions and cattle of anybody in the world are the Maasai. And what the Maasai do are night pens. And if you actually are in a situation where you're having predation, where you have a lion that has decided that those calves are a source of food, um, an electrified night pen um, is definitely an option. And, and you, can, you can even do them with that, that many cattle. Um, however, I think if you're just seeing signs that one's around, I personally wouldn't worry um, unless you've got calving happening right now and you think that that might be why it's around. And in that case, I would probably move the cattle to wherever your, you know, most close in pasture is just for that window of like peak vulnerability. Great. Thank you. Uh, we know also that uh, through the Mountain Lion Foundation, one thing we hear is if ranchers are covering a large area, they can use range riders, uh, you know, which is people on horseback. And like Alan was saying, uh, that wouldn't necessarily need to be a year round operation. I imagine that would get labor intensive, but that could be a, you know, during calving season, um, an additional mode that you could employ. Um, I, we do still have some time left, and I thought we'd do a couple of things, which is address a couple of the comments and questions I saw come up in the room. Michelle, we have one more question. Um, yes, go ahead. So, Anne, go ahead and ask your question. I think you can hear me now, right? Yes. Okay. Um, we, we live in an area of Northern California, Sonoma County, sort of their ranches around and a lot of 10 acre properties and they've always been mountain lions and I've heard them we've been here 30 years three or four times but in the last couple of weeks we've had one and then two when I let the dogs out at night they're just across the fence and it's pretty scary so I'm kind of interested in maybe these fox lights we've been taking the dogs out on leashes now uh, at night and not and in the morning because it's the days are shorter but I am not really sure what else to do we can you see carry it. Flashlight. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to recommend the air horn, um, especially when you're out with the dogs on a leash um, for your own protection and hopefully um, some hazing for the, the mountain lions would be good and the air horn would, would be helpful with that. What's the hazing? Um, hazing is trying to uh, utilize non-lethal methods that deter a mountain lion. So anything that you use that would um, make it less inviting. Uh, hazing methods are anything from sound or loud sound to automatic sprinkler that comes on with, with movement. Uh, lighting can be a method of hazing. Um, rubber uh, uh, bullets can be a method of hazing. Um, something that makes the experience negative but doesn't kill the lion. Okay. Do the fox lights work well? Uh, they're in the midst of doing some studies right now about how different um, hazing methods, um, how effective they are. And I'm really eager for that study to be completed to, to understand some of that. But um, some people have great luck with the fox lights, some people don't. Um, okay. And I think that it's definitely worth a try, um, especially the solar ones, because you don't have to mess with it. You just put it out there. But do remember that after a while, um, they learned that, gee, I can get close to that light and nothing's happened so far. So you have to switch out your methods. Um, okay. You know, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Because it's, it's been about a two week interval. And, but it is pretty scary when they're, there they are with those big yellow eyes. 
<laughs> yeah. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it's not a bad thing to have a lion have territory where you live. It, it can be a, a good thing because it, it limits the, the migratory other cats coming through. But if you have a cat that's living where you live, it needs to be a really respectful, good neighbor. And that means, you know, not coming, you know, right under your deck and not coming into your backyard. Um, you're totally doing the right thing, keeping your dogs um, on leash. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, I, honestly, everything Jane said was was great. Um, my only like um, addition to that, um, from my perspective, is is consider long term relationship building. I mean, you know, what would you do if if um, if a new neighbor moved in and they were being a little rowdier than you would expect them to be, or, you know, they were in your yard first thing in the morning, you know, you wouldn't run them out of town necessarily, but you would tell them like, Hey, you know, this is my yard and I want to have my coffee and I don't want to talk right now. Mm -hmm. um, so just think of it in terms of like establishing those boundaries so that hopefully you have a stable lion that can be there for years and that can keep the turn turnaround and the traffic low in your area. Good, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to address something also that I saw come up in the chat and uh, Jane, you may want to weigh in on this because it was about Julian specifically, but there are some communities that really are working to minimize nighttime ambient light, uh, light pollution. Um, and so someone raised a concern about fox lights. So those are flashing lights, they flash in a, in a random pattern and they can be a good deterrent because they're uh, just sort of disturbing and uh, lions don't know what those are. Um, and if you were worried about uh, light pollution, I suppose that, you know, what you really want is that light to be flashing at, at mountain lion height, you know, just a couple of mm -hmm. feet above the ground. And it would be okay to put that under something so that the light isn't, isn't casting up into the sky. Uh, it, I have a fox light that I use, um, not really for mountain lions, but more for coyote deterrent, because we have a lot of coyotes, more coyotes than mountain lions. But um, I noticed that, that there's not a lot of light that goes up anyway. Um, these little lights are meant to shine out, and um, my neighbors could see them, but they're not disturbing. I mean, it's not a matter of them being so bright it just looks like um looks like if you had somebody uh like uh, you know uh, quite a ways away from you with a flashlight walking around right okay. um it's it's about that much light and that's what we're trying to convey with the fox lights too is that the mountain lion hopefully thinks gee, that's a human thing going on over there. Maybe there's somebody with a flashlight or a vehicle or something like that. I don't want to mess with that. So hopefully that's what's going on in their brain uh, with that. But um, with our dark sky uh, efforts, which I fully support, um, I think that our fox light would be fairly compliant with that. And also the fact that we change it out, you know, every few months to something else. Um, so that, uh, you know, they don't, don't get tired of seeing the light and figure, well, we'll come anyway. So I think that it's okay with, with the dark sky folks and, um, I don't think, I, I haven't taken a fox light to a dark sky meeting, but I think, um, with your question, I shall, uh, thank you, uh, for the reminder of, of those two things coming together. Yes, and to our panelists, feel free to um, weigh in if you have anything else that you'd like to cover or ask each other in the last five minutes or so before we wrap up. Um, but I did see some questions in chat about whether we'd be addressing the, uh, the Utah encounter between a trail runner and a very protective mama. Uh, and of course, we all have um, some thoughts and feelings about that. Our main concern just was if uh, you know, if the media would stop <laughs> sensationalizing this because that absolutely was not 
predatory behavior. Mm -mm, um, mm -mm. So I wonder, uh, and, and then we have one more question. Uh, no, we don't have one more question. Um, so maybe uh, just briefly, we could do a little bit of a round robin and, and you could each weigh in with your, your thoughts on that or advice. There were a lot of things that this person did correctly once the encounter started. He could have probably avoided the encounter uh, just by not approaching the, the baby animals, but maybe they all surprised each other. So uh, Jane, would you like to give us a, a 30 second summary of your thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, my thoughts are, um, I think he did everything right, except perhaps wanting to videotape and getting a little too close. I understand that urge. I would be in awe if I saw kittens crossing the trail, um, but usually mama's somewhere close around there. So, uh, but I think he did everything right. And I want to praise the mountain lion too for being a good mama. She really wasn't interested in hurting him as long as he kept going away. And uh, I loved her, her uh, technique of looking fierce. And I hope that if I run into a mountain lion on a trail, that I can look as fierce as she did because it was pretty scary. Um, but I think that she wasn't interested in really in hurting him. She just wanted to protect her kittens and wanted him to keep moving back. And she was very effective at that. Yes. <laughs> Michelle, can I weigh in on that too? Yes, please, Robin. I have a couple other comments I can wait till later for. On that issue, yep. Uh, if the mountain lion wanted to attack the guy, it would have done so. It did not want to do so. It just wanted to push him back to defend her cubs. She did a great job. Just a little catitude going on there. The kid did the <laughs> right thing. He maybe backed up a little too fast to, to, uh, to give her the impression that she was really having an effect, which she was. But the kid did basically the right thing. And no, that was uh, purely a defensive uh, maternal uh, action, not one of uh, wanting to eat the, eat the guy. Uh, so one of, one of the points, you know, first, when I first saw that, that video, um, and I had so many people send that video to me, and it, it, um, it, it kind of was almost all I got to talk about for a couple of days, which got a little exhausting. <laughs> but initially I was like, how cool that we get to see this um, defensive, you know, display. Um, rad, you know, he should not have approached um, those kittens. Um, many of the videos that were released um, actually cut out the beginning um, where he is filming and he's walking forward and taking three or four steps forward, um, filming the kittens. And she said he thought they were bobcats, whatever that is, just don't do that. Just don't do that. And I think a very, very important takeaway from that video is that, you know, panic is, is panic. And um, if you look carefully and you actually see the whole video, one of the two kittens that is actually in front and is on the um, the gravel road, when it panics and breaks, it runs towards him, mm -hmm. and that's the that's when Mama shows up. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't necessarily trust that you know a, a baby animal is going to make better decisions than you're making, and is going to know which direction to run away from you if you're being weird with a phone near it. Um, so. You know, it, that's something to remember is that if you're, if you are putting yourself in a position where you, you know, you're approaching wild animals, when they run, they might run towards you like this, this kitten did and mama's mama doesn't play with that. Yeah. Um, so she was very generous with him. I mean, remember these cats can jump 12 feet. She was plenty close enough to kill him if she wanted to. And she didn't, she didn't want to do that. She wanted him to leave. Um, and again, it's another time if, if you have, you know, if you're going to go hiking, bring someone with you, ideally. Um, carry an air horn. They're cheap. They can save your life. In more situations than that, I mean, if you break your leg out there, you'll wish you had it. Um, if for whatever reason you don't have an air horn, wear a whistle around your neck. Um, you know, he probably should have backed up a little bit more slowly, but Frankly, you know, I'm not sure that I would have had the presence of mind to do any different than he did. 
in yeah. that situation. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I'm, what I'm really hoping, I'm seeing in the chat that there are people that have already tried to go kill that mother lion because of this incident. And that's why I went from, you know, how, you know, how cool to see that, you know, big paw clap behavior on video mm -hmm. like that. That looked a lot like when I was in, encountered this teenage mountain lion and I don't have video of that. So it went immediately to, you know, real, a real sense of indignation and, and upset on my part because yeah, immediately there were calls to, yeah. to kill this lion and so many comments saying, this is why you need a gun if you go in the woods. And it's like, you know, you trespass in someone's house and they have the grace and kindness to calmly escort you out unharmed and your takeaway is that you should have shot them. Right, yeah. So we humans have so much to learn and um, you all have done a great part of helping humans learn more about how we can coexist with these wild neighbors of ours. Thank you so much, Dane and Robin and Gowan. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for everybody who joined us today. Thank you for your questions and your thoughtfulness and um, keep working to save America's lion. <laughs>